Testing. All right, let's get started. Um, welcome to CS uh, 3510. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is, I think this is lecture eight, is on um, uh, what's called the Bellman Ford uh, and uh, Floyd Warshall algorithms. So last time we did uh, Kruskal's algorithm, we talked about the problem of a minimum spanning tree. And we talked about how a greedy algorithm, uh, you know, it might be easy to define, but then maybe it's hard to prove. Uh, we're going back to single source shortest path algorithms today, and then we'll talk about a different setting. So these are problems for the single source shortest path problem. Bellman Ford is at first, and then uh, Floyd Warshall is for what's called the all pairs shortest path problem. So just quickly, we have single source. Uh, shortest paths, uh, and then we have all pairs, uh, shortest path. So single source shortest path is an algorithm that you know where you're starting and you want to compute the distance to some destination. The way we phrase the problem is there's a single source but then you compute the distance to every location. The reason you do this is because usually you don't know if you already knew where the location was, you probably already knew the minimum distance. So the way we phrase it is that you compute it from a single source to all possible locations. So a single source shortest path, these algorithms include VFS, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm, Bellman Ford, as we'll see today. All pair shortest path is if you want to compute the distance between all possible pairs of uh, any given a set of, of vertices in a connected graph, you want to compute the minimum distance from any path to any other path, right? Now, um, Let's talk about Dijkstra's algorithm, which was a week ago. Let's talk about kind of what its failures were. So uh, the, the, one of the most efficient parts of Dijkstra's algorithm was the fact that uh, once the shortest path, once an element has uh, come to the top of the priority queue, right? so for Dijkstra's you have something that looks like this. You have maybe, we'll draw it like this. You have some, let's say, v3 uh, of value 10, and then v7 of uh, value, I don't know, 14, and so on, right? This is some priority queue, and then you want to pop off the smallest element. Well, the, one of the greatest properties of Dijkstra's algorithm is the fact that when you pop off a smallest element, you know that you don't have to look at it again, simply because you've already computed the shortest path. And the reason you know you've computed the shortest path is because, sort of inductively, all the other paths that could come from any of the other uh, edges must be longer. The current shortest path of v3 in this example of the priority queue would be 10, but the current shortest path to v7 is 14. So any other path to v3 that put, could possibly go through v7, like maybe, maybe the shortest path for v3 requires updating some of the outgoing edges of v7 and then computing something to v3, that won't matter simply because the, the, the path to v7 is already 14. And we know 10 is less than 14. So this is one of the, the, the really the reason why Dijkstra algorithm is so efficient. It, it, it has the ability to, uh, you, you have this guarantee that the thing you pop off, its path has been minimized. And you know it's minimal, simply by this property. But this property is only true for graphs with uh, non-negative edge weights, right? So first convince yourself that Dijkstra's algorithm works in the case where edges can have uh, weight zero, right? Uh, then notice that it actually doesn't work in the case that uh, there's negative edge weights. For example, suppose there was like uh, v7 to, I don't know, v3 of like uh, negative 100, something like that, right? Well, you would have to, you can't pop off v3 and just conclude, yeah, the shortest distance is um, 10 because now the, you, the shortest distance could actually go through uh, the start, v0, whatever, to v7, which would be 14. And then you can go from v7 to v3, subtracting 100. So the shortest distance from uh, the start to v3 would go through v7 and would be much less than what is currently maintained as the minimum. So with, with a negative edge weighted graph, with negative edge weights, the first problem is the Dijkstra's property, the beautiful property that it has doesn't work. 
So negative edge weights, although it seems like, oh, I'm simply making comparisons in Dijkstra's algorithm, so certainly I should be able to make comparisons uh, just b through negative numbers. It doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't hold up. Uh, it's, it's very, very important. Um, another intuitive reason we can explain this is like, uh, you know, like in a video game, you got a power up, and then you may go out of the way to get the power up. Dijkstra's algorithm doesn't think like that. So like if you have like, let's say something like this, 100, 100, uh, negative 1,000, or like 2, right? Sort of the way Dijkstra's algorithm looks kind of locally is like you're at this start. Let's say you're trying to get from A to B. It doesn't seem worth it to go up the hill and then back down, right? It doesn't really know that. It's going to look at the 2 and update that first. Eventually, it'll take more than local updates uh, to know that taking this path of length 100 ends up making it better. Right? So in some sense, it goes through the smallest paths it knows at that time. But it doesn't know that perhaps as you go farther away, uh, maybe you can come back down. That's another reason why Dijkstra's doesn't work. Um, the negative edge weighted case of shortest path problem is also not that interesting, to be honest. Simply because in the real world, things aren't negatively weighted. Negative numbers aren't real. Debt isn't real. It's simply you owe money in the other direction. So it's a magnitude problem, right? Um, what is the negative distance? You know, what is negative latency? And all the problems we wish to model with shortest paths and graphs, I don't really think of the negative ones uh, usefully. There are some, and you'll see one of those on the homework. Um, but I don't know. I think everything, positive numbers are really nice, and negative numbers are not. Uh, another reason is, what is the negative distance in this graph? What's the shortest distance from A to B? Yeah, it's, it's negative infinity. So um, if your graph contains a negative edge weighted, it's what's called a negative cycle. If your graph contains a negative cycle, which means a cycle such that the sum of the edges on the cycle are negative, it could con the cycle is allowed to contain some positive values. But if the whole total sum of the cycle is negative, then anything that can touch this cycle has a path to in and out of this cycle. If there's something into the cycle, something out of the cycle, the shortest distance between those two must be negative infinity. Right? You have an infinite power up loop. You go, right? it's 2, or is it 0, or is it negative 2, and so on. Right? So um, the fact that negative cycles may exist in a problem itself is uh, again, kind of worrisome because, with, again, how well defined is the negative shortest path problem? Dijkstra's algorithm is basically optimal uh, for non negative edge weights. Um, and there's this tiny implementation speed up here and there, but it's basically as good as it gets. And that's what kind of what makes it so beautiful. But the, we're, we're still finding ways to compute uh, better negative edge weighted shortest path problems with different settings. There's, this is still like an active area of research. Some of these papers in this area are like 70, 80 pages or whatever, and they're still trying to figure it out. You know, they're not as elegant as Dijkstra's algorithm. All right, any question on the setting before we just get into uh, how to do this? Awesome. So, like, um, how does Dijkstra's work? Uh, again, what it really does is it updates the vertices in order. So it really computes like a dist of v is equal to the min of dist v, comma dist uh, u plus luv, if luv is defined, right? That's sort of what Dijkstra does at each point, and it kind of knows to do that in order. Um, so what the Bellman-Ford algorithm does, and Bellman-Ford is an algorithm that works on uh, negative edge-weighted graphs, including those with a negative cycle. So Bellman-Ford kind of looks to inspiration for Dijkstra's algorithm, sees where it fails, and tries to fix it. It doesn't have the ability to have a priority queue and pop something off and then never look at that vertex again, right? Like we described previously here, you may have to go through seven, uh, you may have to go back you may have to look back at uh, 
7 to, to find a shorter distance to 3. So just because it's the smallest at that point doesn't mean it won't be smaller in the future. So it's like the same way it does what's called this uh, relaxation or updating. Sort of terms that don't mean too much. But basically, you keep, the, you keep track of the minimum distance computed at that point. And then in the future, if you happen to compute a shorter distance, then you update it to that. And then hopefully, you have some termination condition. And when the algorithm is finished, hope you're done with, you have all the shortest paths, right? So during the process, the development forward is going to compute this. It's going to basically re re repeatedly apply this formula. And that's going to uh, give us the shortest path. It won't have the nice property that Dijkstra's have where you can pop it off the queue. It's just going to simply repeatedly do this for all vertices over and over until it's done. Yes? So you run DFS from the start node, and then what? Oh, I see. You're trying to. You're asking what the longest path in the graph is. What if there's a negative cycle? It's a hard problem, right? Um, right. But do we believe this? This. Re yeah. We'll talk about shortest path on acyclic graphs. Actually, it's actually that. Actually, that'll work. We'll talk. We'll talk about that later, um, in that setting. Well, but uh, with, the, with an addendum, it'll work. Um, why is this recurrence true? Well, it's not really a recurrence, but basically, like if you have u here, and let's say you're starting, we'll call it s, actually. And what you're at here, you're at some v, and then some, there's some other node u, and let's say there's an edge uv of length l uv, right? Some shortest path has been computed to uh, s to u, which will be recorded as dis u. And then some shortest path is considered this way as dis v, right? So maybe there's a shorter path dis v already recorded, but maybe that's longer. Maybe you find a shorter path through u. So u is just something that you can loop over to do this, right? And again, Dijkstra, is, you get to pop things off the priority queue. You don't get to pop things off the way Bellman Ford does it. So just suppose you take Dijkstra without the ability of popping things off the priority queue. So it's not a priority queue anymore. It's simply an array, and then you're just going to Update the array repeatedly, and how many after you're done updating the array, the values will be the minimum distance. That's really all Bellman Ford is. But how many times do you need to update the array? You need to update it as many times as a node could be updated, which is the length of the longest path in a graph. Given a graph of v vertices, what's the longest path in the graph? Yeah, the longest path in a graph of v vertices has length v minus 1. Why? You just hit all v vertices, and that's v minus 1 edges, right? The ends, at each edge has two endpoints, and so you, they overlap the middle, you're going to get v minus 1 edges. So Bellman Ford is simply going to run that, this, that, that update on all of the vertices, v minus, excuse me, all the edges, v minus 1 times. Yes? How does it work for negative cycles? Let's suppose that there's only negative weights and then no negative cycles. And then we'll talk about the negative cycle at the end of Bellman Ford. Bellman Ford actually gives you a way to detect a negative cycle as well. But let's suppose there's no negative cycles just for now. And then we'll talk about how it detects this. Yeah. So uh, uh, when you do DFS style algorithms, they're not really good for shortest path problems. You have to use BFS style. Right? There are many algorithms that it won't return, including just the number of edges. It certainly won't. Re the first path DFS returns will not. Um, so I guess that would work for a shortest path from a specific start to a specific end. But what about all pairs of vertices that have a shortest path to a certain thing? Even though it is a single source problem. Let's talk, let's talk about it. I'm sure that would work as well. I'm sure, I'm sure vanilla cycle finding will find a negative weighted cycle as well, uh, right? With some dynamic programming thrown in there. You keep track of a few things. Um, so here's how Bellman Ford works. Y 
You have a graph G, you have a set of weights or lengths, and then you have a start. Now, how do you encode the, a weighted graph? You could keep it in the adjacency list. You could keep it as a separate auxiliary data structure. Just for board notation, we're going to keep it in this uh, 2 to your rate uh, called L, right? Yes? Well, it has a start and an end, right? Every, every well, you, it doesn't really matter. You could somehow need to access the weight of the edge, which is defined with its endpoints u and v. You see, you need some way to loop over the edges. So you simply do so by looping over all pairs of vertices, right? Um, uh, for all u in uh, v, uh, dist of u is going to be infinity. So you're going to update every vertice to have infinite distance from the start. But then the start, you'll update to have distance 0 from itself. Great. Um, for i in range of v minus 1, uh, for each e equals uh, u comma v uh, in e dist of v uh, takes on the min of dist v and dist u plus luv. I hope that's clear what's going on there. So you simply just take the obvious Dijkstra's part, and then you don't pop things off a priority queue. You just keep everything in the quote unquote priority queue, which is now has no priority, so it's simply an array. And you just call this update on it over and over and over and over. But because you're taking the min, if you've already found the minimum, you won't replace it, right? But you will check all the other paths in case there's another negative path that goes through somewhere and does something, right? Now, uh, what's the runtime of this? Someone yell? VE. It's not that early, right? V, E, OK, V. What was the runtime of Dijkstra's? Uh, v plus, okay. It was a trick question. It depends on the implementation of the uh, priority queue. If you use a, um, a binary heap, which is not actually the most efficient sometimes, it's uh, v plus e log v. Uh, if your graph is dense, of course, you can use an array. If it, if it, it could actually just be v log v plus e, turns out. Uh, but that requires understanding what a Fibonacci heap is. But we can kind of safely say it's probably v plus e log v, right? Immediately, we notice the difference between these. This is like quasi-linear time. This is like v and then v log v and then e log v. That seems kind of simple. v e is big, right? If the graph is dense, if the graph is dense, there's as many edges as, as pairs of vertices. So in the case that the graph is dense, Bellman Ford runs in cubic time. Not that good. Do we see that? If, v is kind of v, if e is kind of v squared, this is not that good. Unfortunately, it's probably the best you could do uh, in this case uh, with this amount of trivial knowledge that we have. right? Um, let's run it on a simple example, and then we'll talk about um, negative cycle finding. So consider this example. Um, another thing is this doesn't actually compute the path itself. It simply computes the minimum distance. But I expect you to know that you can easily modify this to store the path itself by using a series of back pointers, right? When you, if you do update, you would just simply check this with an if statement. And then if it is updated, then you update the previous of v to be u and so on. And that would store the actual pointers itself. Yes? Uh, so really, that's, I was thinking about that as I wrote that. The variable's not used. 
You simply update everything v minus 1 times. Yeah, I was, yeah, I don't like that notation personally because it feels like it's a fill in the blank. But uh, I could, yeah, I know, but letters are supposed to be variables. And um, it's, just know that this, and, and in the books it say, it doesn't say it like this. What it says is do v minus 1 times and then the inner loop. In the worst, worst case, yeah. There could be the v minus 1th path has to come back to it, right? In the worst, worst case. More questions on uh, Bellman forward implementation before we get to the example? Yeah? Um, we'll, talk, well, the longest path is v uh, minus 1 in a graph of v vertices. Because the longest, the last update you'll have to do occurs at the longest path, right? The longest path corresponds to the last update necessary. Consider like a really extremal looking graph such that it has all these negative things going on. And when is the last time you can update something? It turns out that what you've pointed out there, the v versus v minus 1 is actually what's going to help us detect negative, ed negative cycles. So, but the v minus 1th round will have the final values. Right. OK, um, so let's simply update this. I'm going to write this, in, uh, we'll say round. Um, uh, round, well, there's four vertices, so there's going to be three rounds. So we'll start with 0, 1, 2, 3. Um, so we initialize. we initialize uh, s as 0 and everything else as infinity, right? So this is not a two-dimensional array. This is simply I'm showing you how the array is written to uh, v minus 1 times. Then what you're going to do is simply uh, compute the min, dist v is going to take on the min of dist v and dist u plus luv. But notice that um, all of these three values are infinity right now. So the dist v for all of those, when a, b, or c is the u in the, in the, in the, in the min, is going to be infinity. So the only edges that will end up being updated are the ones outgoing of s. So the only ones you're going to update first are going to be s goes to a and s goes to b. s goes to a is going to be 10. s goes to b is going to be 11. And then there is no edge coming to c, so it's going to be infinity. right? Now let's perform the update again. We're going to look at. Uh, this, this is, these are the dist v values. We're going to compute dist u plus luv and take the min. This, of course, is going to be 0. Um, c is going to be infinity plus negative 20, which is going to be infinity still. So we're not going to look at that one. Uh, s goes to a is going to be 0 plus 10, which is still 10. So this is still 10. Um, s goes to b is going to be 11. There's another incoming edge to compare it to. So that's going to be 11. Um, C uh, is going to be the distance v. The distance of C currently is infinity. But notice that we have dist of u, which is 11, plus luv, which is 12. So that's going to be 11 plus 12 is 23, right? Now we have, uh, at the second round, we have 10, a 0, 10, 11, 23. Let's perform all the updates on all the edges again. We're going to, s goes to a is going to update a to be 10, which is fine. S is, this is, of course, going to be 0. Uh, s goes, goes to a is going to be 0. I mean, excuse me, s goes to a is going to be, uh, that's going to keep this 10. s goes to b is going to be 11, so that's going to keep that the same. Uh, b goes to c is going to be 11 plus 12, which is still 23. And then last is c goes to a, which is going to be the value of c, which is 23 minus 20. So this is going to be 3 now, but these are going to stay the same. Do we see what happened? We updated this one to be 23. Only after we updated c to be 20, we updated this one to be 3 only after we computed the distance of c to be 23. Right? We didn't compute this until we computed this, because previously, in the previous round, this was infinity. So infinity minus 20 is just infinity. So after we were able to compute a distance to that node, could we take that negative edge and go back and update uh, a? Now we update a, actually what would keep going on if a had outgoing edges, all the shortest paths that had previously been computed using a value of 10, those will also all have to update. That's why it takes v minus 1 rounds. 
Questions? Yeah? You're at all vertices, all rounds. That's the difference. You're not simply visiting locally. Dijkstra's is greedy, but uh, Bellman Ford isn't. So think of these as different arrays, or just updates to the same array. This is an array of five elements, and I'm just showing you what changes in the array each time. Distance u and distance v are the current vertices stored in the array at some, at some round. So if we're at round this, and round would be i, um, distance of s is 0 and distance of a is 10. But then later on, if we're at round 3, the distance of a is going to be 3. Yeah, sure. So let's do like distance of uh, a is going to take on the min of uh, distance a and distance of uh, c plus l c a, right? Uh, distance of a currently is what you is currently in the array. So this is going to be the min of 10, and distance of c is currently at round 2 is going to be 23. And uh, distance of LUV, though, is going to be 20. Yeah. And again, whatever a would, after you've updated a, all the paths that may have been previously shortly computed through a would have to be redone. Yes? Um, the each, the i is here is the, is the round number. And then when you're looking at dist v, you're looking at the ones that are previously updated and not the ones you may have updated currently. So you do check uh, each edge at each round. And you check the edges if they update the vertices. Yeah, a lot of the other algorithms, BFS, DFS, have a, an, have a, a local analogy in the sense that you're visiting this current n n vertex, then you visit this other current vertex in the sense that it's traversal. Same even for Dijkstra's. It's like, this is the next one. I'm at this one. Right. Bellman 4 is a global-ish looking algorithm, right? It doesn't have that, I'm at this current thing. It just simply checks the edges and sees if they update that current minimum. And if, they, if it's minimal, then it keeps doing it. Uh, well, c is not infinity, we, but we begin with dist c equaling infinity because we haven't computed it yet. And we begin the algorithm by starting each vertice that's not the start with dist v, with dist c equaling infinity. Eventually, we'll update it. So breadth first search does what? You're looking at the neighboring nodes. So I agree. Yeah, like, like uh, if you noticed round one, round one, the only things that are updated are the things that were updated previously in round zero. And that does kind of feel like BFS. I, I see how you could think that. The infinity has that property. But as you go through, BFS would stop after everything is visited. Imagine you have like a million rounds of something. Like something is very, very connected, right? You've visited every node. Something's very, very connected, but it has few nodes. You've already visited every node, but then you have to keep updating paths. Yeah, v minus 1 rounds. Yeah. Yeah. L is the length of the edge uv. L is for length, the weight. L, so somehow you have to encode the edges, and this is an implementation issue usually. For the point of writing a bo an algorithm on a board, we're simply going to keep it as an extra two-dimensional array. That you can, yeah, you could keep it simply as a tuple in the adjacency list. That's probably better, but you know, for clarity, why not just write LUV to mean the distance?
or the length, or I guess because it, it's negative, I shouldn't say L. I should say W for weight. But all right, yeah. One more time. Uh, well, look at round one. Round one, you simply check all the edges that go into uh, that. You check all the edges. There's four edges to check. So round zero is this. Round one, you check all the edges. You're going to update A. You're going to update B. You're not going to update C. And you're not going to update that A that way. Because it's going to have to be, uh, this can't be infinity for the update to work. Right? It's going to be infinity is equal to the min of infinity and infinity minus 20. So it's infinity. You only update it if the node that you're currently at has already been updated. Yeah? Uh, so that would, might be a negative cycle. And l let me answer the question about how Bellman Ford detects a negative cycle. Uh, here's how you can find a Bell. Uh, so we know that the v minus one round contains the final values. Here's how you find a negative cycle. Run uh, Bellman Ford uh, one more round. If any dist value decreases, there exists a negative cycle. Just run it one more time. So v minus 1 in that loop, and then at the bottom you would have a separate loop, and then it would just be like, repeat this, this part uh, one time, and then just record if a Boolean if any dist value changes. And if a dist value changes, uh, then you know there exists a negative cycle. Now what you do with that negative cycle is, is, is really your problem. Like, do you want to just say, oh, it's not defined. I'm just going to throw out the input. Do you want to just start, start doing some exploring and find paths towards this negative cycle? Right? In fact, the things that will update should be on the negative cycle. Right? Anything that, if you run it, let's say you run it for 10 rounds. The things that update have to be connected to the negative cycle, and the things that don't update aren't connected to the negative cycle. Right? Yeah. No, the calculation for C is going to be uh, the dist C is equal to uh, the min of what? Dist C. Uh, and uh, let's suppose we're calculating this edge B to C. You want to do that one. Um, and we're doing the, we're computing round one. Yeah. Right. So we'll be uh, dist B uh, plus L uh, B comma C, right? Well, what is dist C currently at round one? You have to look back to round zero because we haven't written down dist C. So it's going to be infinity and the minimum of infinity minus 20, which is infinity. So it doesn't update. Yeah. Yes? Absolutely. It's this part. I'm not started yet. The loop will start at one. All right, let's do a more complicated Bellman Ford example. That was only a, that only had four nodes and four edges.
All right, we have eight vertices, so we're going to have seven rounds. Uh, and we have eight vertices. Right? So first round, it's going to be 0 and infinities for all these. Right? The first round, of course, the only things we'll end up updating are the things that are outgoing of s. So s goes to a is going to be updating the distance to a to be 10. And s goes to g is going to update that distance to be 8. Do you agree? Now, I'm, just for clarity, I'm not going to write all the um, infinities, but you can, I'll just leave those blank, right? Um, now, what are we going to update? We're going to, let's say we're at round two. We're going to update all the edges that have value. So those are going to actually only going to be the ones outgoing of G, S, and A. Uh, a is going to update E to be 12. Uh, it's going to, G is going to update F to be 9. And then G is going to stay 8. Uh, A is going to stay 10, but not for long. Uh, and then S will stay 0, right? Double check with me that we're doing that right. Now notice that we computed a path from S to G of 8 and then G to F of 1. But then since we've computed F, there is a path from, there's an edge from F to A of negative 4. So we can actually, rather than going from S to A, we can go S to G to F to A. And we can go with uh, 9 minus 4, which is 5, which is less than 10. So this should be 5 now. Yes? Ah, so we update everything. Now, in implementation, you can change this. But I'm only looking at the previous row. Yeah. So were I doing this in practice, I'm sure that would actually be OK. Uh, but just for the clarity of knowing that the runtime is v plus e, I'm looking previously. And because f was updated that round, it's infinity. Next round, which we'll see in a second, it will do exactly what you just said. Right? Um, so, but a notice is updating to 5. Uh, and there's an edge of, we're also going to update the outgoing of e. e has been computed, computed to be 12. And there's an edge going of, of negative 2 to b. So b is going to be 12 minus 2, which is 10. Right? E uh, has an incoming edge now of f has 9, and we have that minus 1 edge in f, so it's going to be 8 here. 9, 8, and those are going to stay the same. Uh, round 4, uh, so this is where it gets complicated doing it on the board, but you know the computer is going to do this for us. Um, this is going to stay the same. This is going to stay the same. Um, B has an incoming edge of E, which has now been computed to be 8. So we can actually go B to E with minus 2. We updated E twice. So notice we're going to update it again. When E was 12, we updated B to be 10. But since we updated E to be 8, we have to update B to be 6. Right? Once you, you, up, you compute the node, it computes all its distances. If you update the node, you've got to go back and recompute re everything, right? Um, now, uh, we have an incoming edge of D from a computed value of C being, wait. For some reason, I have C is 11 here. I'm not sure where that's coming from, so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, e has an incoming edge of D. Oh, B goes to C. That's correct. That's correct. B goes to C. And B was 10, so this is going to be 11. OK. OK, yes, OK. Um, D is going to be a computed value of uh, nothing still. E has an incoming edge now from computed uh, value of A. A was 5, so E is going to be 5 plus 2, which is going to be 7. 
Uh, e and, uh, excuse me, F and G are not going to change. Um, now, we're on round five. C is going to have an incoming edge of one from B. So, So this is going to stay the same. This is going to stay the same. Uh, this, the value of C at round 5 should be 5. I'm going to ignore that one again. Um, the value of D, maybe C, yes. No, my bad. This should still remain 5. Okay. The value of C is going to be computed to be uh, 6 plus 1, which is 7. Okay, there we go. Um, the value of D is going to be computed to the previous round C, which is 11 plus 3, is going to be 14 here. There we go. Uh, e is going to be computed of the previous round. The incoming edges are going to be from F, which was 9. And again, it's going to be, remain as 7. These are going to remain 7, 9, 8. Right? Round 6, I claim the only thing that's going to update is going to be D and E. Just to speed this up a little bit. Uh, why? Well, s excuse me, uh, C and D. Uh, C has an incoming edge from B, and B has been recomputed from 6 to 5. So we have to go 5 plus 1 instead of 6 plus 1. So this is going to be a 6. And uh, D has an incoming edge of 3 from the previous rounds 7. So this is going to, instead of 11, this is going to be 10. Three plus, uh, 7 plus 3 is 10. And then the final round, we're going to, uh, these are all going to stay the same again. 0, 5, 5, uh, 7, 9, 8. And then uh, nothing is going to update C, so this is going to remain 6. But then we have an incoming edge of D of, from C, which has been updated from 7 to 6. So this has to be updated to 6 plus 3 instead of 7 plus 3, so this is going to be 9. OK, there we go. And the last is the column associated with the final values. Yes? Yeah, so you can notice, notice how this went from 6 to 5. But because there's an edge B to C of 1, that makes this go, because this goes 6 to 5, that makes this go 7 to 6, right? But there may be other edges that update something, right? So it may not just be, maybe there's two things, whichever one's smallest, you'll take the min of eventually, right? So yeah, the change, that's why it takes V minus 1 rounds to do it. Yes? OK. What you do is you just run Bellman forward one more round. Yeah. In the case that there's negative, it depends how you phrase what you want to do when you find a negative cycle. If you want to actually keep track of the ones that are the minimum distance is quote unquote negative infinity, you can do that. Otherwise, you can throw the problem away. Right, you can just say I'm not going to work on a negative age-weighted cycle. I mean, you know, in a practical sense, it's like if you try to model somehow like stocks or trading or something through positive and neg ed negative edge weights. If you have a negative cycle in a graph like that, that means you found an infinite money glitch. So there's something wrong economically. Yes, the sum of the edges on the cycle is negative because you said negative a thousand. This is not a negative cycle. It depends on the rest of the connectivity of the graph. But this is not a negative cycle. The longest path back to itself is still positive. So there's no infinite money glitch. For this one, it depends on the actual weight. It would be negative infinity. If the edge was there, it would not. You would take the min of the path to get to the negative, side, the negative back, and it would be the min of zero in that. So it would be that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
Which ones? Yeah, so like when you implement it, you could consider the current value, but I'm just showing you as if it was the previous value, right? And the, what that, the only difference between that is the order you update the nodes in, right? That would, might be faster, but f for clarity of the algorithm, we'll do it that way. Right. All right, let's talk about, um, we've talked about how to solve this in the case that there's negative edge weights. We've talked about how to de detect if there's a negative edge weighted cycle. You simply run the algorithm again. If there was, this does compute shortest paths, minimizing them, right? At each step it finds a min and then it determines if another's a min and it replaces that. So in the case of the negative cycle, the, the minimum value is negative infinity. So the algorithm wouldn't terminate if we did not have this V minus one termination condition. So what you do is you run Bellman Ford one more time Detect if anything changes, and if anything changes, then you know there must exist a negative cycle, and you, in fact, know what touches the negative cycle, right? Um, awesome. Let's talk about uh, another scenario you might want to compute shortest paths. And let's consider shortest paths on graphs that are DAGs. Any more questions on Bellman Ford? Yeah? There are a few ways to do it. Man. Uh, the way, another way you could do it is simply do v minus 1 more updates. And then if nothing changes in those v minus 1 more updates, then, man. Then you know um, the things that change in the v minus 1 updates have to be connected to the negative cycle. Because what if the negative cycle is v minus 1 away from where you're currently at? So I, I, I like the setting more that you just throw away the problem, and I don't have to think about it. That's like an uh, implementa implementation issue, maybe. It's not really, but you know, in the spirit of the problem, uh, let's, uh, we don't want to think about it too hard. Right? Um, all right, let's uh, do shortest paths. in a DAG. So DAG has this great property that you don't have to uh, do any like look back updates. First off, and, and, uh, and, uh, in a DAG, and we can even include uh, non-negative edge weights. Uh, excuse me, we can even include negative edge weights. Right? So uh, this is actually a very easy problem. There's no cycle. There's nothing that, like, in the future, even there's negative edge weights that you can come back and update it in the past. It's like the, if you update it, the shortest path to a certain node is going to come definitely from its incoming nodes. And it's going to be the min of those when those have already been computed and fixed. Uh, and we know how to, quote unquote, put a DAG in order, right? What is, what is that? Top sort. So here's all you're going to do to put the, you're going to do, you put in top sort, it's an ordering topologically so that the, or you can do things in that order and guarantee you won't have a precedence issue, right? It's again like a scheduling or like class association or shoes and socks. You have to do certain things in a certain order. And sometimes it doesn't matter what order you, order you do certain things, but sometimes it does. So simply compute this update on, and by update we mean the, the relaxation. You take the min of the current value and the edge. You simply, in order, top sort order, you simply compute the min for each of its outgoing edges. And then that's it. So here's how the shortest path in the DAG with, not, with negative edges works. Uh, top sort G for B in a V in top sort order. Um, for edge, we'll call this one u. For edge, uh, u comma v 
in uh, E, uh, dist of V takes on min of dist, dist V, comma, uh, dist U plus LUV. That's it. You simply update the edges uh, after you do that. Let's do a quick example of this one. So like, I'm missing something that you initialize the start to be uh, dist s takes on 0, others in infinity, right? So um, all you're going to do is simply, once you've computed the top sort of the DAG, you simply look at the vertices in order, and you know you don't have to look backwards, right? The shortest path from a start to something, assuming your start is the one of the roots, uh, one of the sources, something that comes first in the top sort, the shortest path has to go from all the things before it and none of the things that come after it. The shortest path to, if we call this SABC, the shortest path to A cannot include BC, simply by top sort properties. That's why it works, right? So what's the shortest path to S? It's going to be. Uh, we'll say uh, dist values of um, uh, S, A, uh, B, and C. And this is going to be 0, infinity, infinity, infinity. And then let's, uh, for each one, we're going to update its outgoing edges. So the outgoing edges of S is going to update A. So this is going to be 0, 2, um, infinity, infinity. The outgoing edges of A, oh, excuse me, it's going to update B as well to be 7. All right. The outgoing edges of A are going to be 3 and 1. So you update B to be 2 plus 3, which is less than 7. So that's 5. And then you update C to be 2 plus 1, which is 3. And then A cannot be updated in anymore. So it's going to be 2, and that's going to be 0. You're going to update the outgoing edges of B, which is simply going to update C to be 5 plus 1, which is 6, which is not less than it. So we're done. Those are the final values, right? Notice how you, as because you can go in order S, A, B, C, and you only update the outgoing edges. I first updated these two edges, then I updated these two edges, and then I updated that edge. Because we knew what order to do them, we get a pretty, it's pretty efficient. It's really efficient. What is the um, runtime of this algorithm? Well, so top sort takes how long? Yeah, top sort is a DFS, so it's like a V plus E. Here's a little tricky, tri uh, slightly trickier one. What's the uh, runtime of the second loop? It will, let's call you, you would think that. That was a trick question. It's not v times e. The reason is, is because although you do go for all u and v, and then you do go for all e and e, you don't touch an edge twice. So it's imagine that you have 10 things, and you look at it three at a time, two at a time, five at a time. Right? So the loop is going to be 3, 2, 5. But the sum of the loop, the length of the loops is not going to be e. It's going to be a sum of the uh, a sum of the sum of the length of the loops is going to sum to e. So each edge is looked at once, and each vertice is looked at once. So this is also going to be uh, v plus e. We agree. This is going to be the first loop is going to take. There's one, two, three, four, five edges, and there's four vertices. So it's not going to take four. It's not going to take five times four steps. It's going to take two steps. Then it's going to take two steps, and then it's going to take one step. And that's going to sum to the number of edges. Right? Yes? Graphs have many complicated parts. And a cycle may not even look like a cycle. right? Is this a cycle? Actually, yes, that's clearly a cycle. But that's a cycle of length 6, or two cycles of length 4, right? 
It doesn't have to look like a cycle. But it may be convoluted on to what the paths are, right? A lot of inconnectedness can happen, and it's not obvious that what you suggest may work in this in a huge setting, right? It's breaking the cycle does what? You delete the vertices, you delete the edge. You, what, what, is, what has changed? What are, what are the positive paths that go through that edge that maybe you've deleted? You know, it, things can get quite messy and complicated when you have such a topological object. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, Dijkstra's won't work with negative edge weights, and this one I claim will. That's it. Dijkstra's would work as well, but then that's slightly worse runtime. In the case that it's a DAG, it's efficient. Right. Let's quickly contrast all the uh, algorithms we know for shortest paths. Um, if you have an unweighted graph, what's the best algorithm for an unweighted, finding the shortest path, in, a single source shortest path algorithm in an unweighted graph? Breath first, first, breath BFS. What's the runtime of BFS? Yeah. Uh, what about uh, non negative edge weighted? Dijkstra's. Uh, and it's like V plus E log V to us. Uh, what about if you have, in the general case, you can have positive negative weights? Bellman Ford. Uh, what's the runtime of Bellman Ford again? Uh, what about it's a DAG? We just did this one. It's like uh, whatever that's called. We can give it a name top sort plus one update. It's not named after anyone cool, so. Right, so those are the kind of differences in the runtimes for the different scenarios that you have to do. Um, and these are just the, the four bread and butter tools for single source shortest path problems. Right. Um, let's talk about uh, a different problem for a little bit, all pairs shortest paths. So all pair shortest paths, you want to compute the distance for all possible pairs. You don't know where you're starting. You want to compute everything for everyone. You want to compute all, you want to return a set of pairs of distances for all possible starts and ends, directed or undirected. Let's just suppose simply for now we're in a all pair shortest path scenario, but we have positive edge weights, right? What's an algorithm immediately that you should know that should do this for us? For the all pair shortest path problem, what's a quick algorithm to, to solve this problem? There's a, there's a worse answer. I'm looking for the bad answer. Dijkstra's n times. Right? Uh, what's the runtime of that? If you you want to compute the shortest distance for all possible pairs, so you simply run Dijkstra's from each vertice as a source, and then just take a bunch of mins of everything. Uh, that's going to give you v times the runtime of Dijkstra's, which is going to be uh, v squared plus uh, v e log v, right? And actually, that's not too bad, uh, like to be honest. But what about if the graph is dense? If the graph is dense, then we know that like uh, if g dense, then like uh, uh, the set of edges is approximately uh, v squared. So we can ballpark this kind of like uh, v o of v cubed log v, right? That doesn't seem as good now. All of a sudden, um, what's the lower bound on this problem? Like a trivial one. All pairs shortest paths. Of course, every algorithm has a constant time algorithm. You need a, the return zero call. Yeah? V squared. Why? You need to write down the pairs. And so just 
that just v squared pairs. So you probably won't beat v squared. You're not going to get something nice like v log v. So v squared is OK. Um, I will show you an algorithm today called floyd Warshall. We can do it in v cubed. So we shave off that log factor in the dense setting. If v, if, do the math. If g is not dense, actually, we don't save that much with floyd Warshall. Uh, but it does compute all pairs shortest paths uh, effectively. So uh, basically, every and this will is a, a good segue into the next unit after the exam and the review session on dynamic programming. But you basically, in a graph, you have all these little pieces of information. And you reuse them constantly. The shortest path from i to j may, go, may contain the shortest path of a path that's part of that path, composed. So the paths all reuse all this information. And so Floyd Warshall takes great advantage of writing a bunch of stuff down and reusing it. So what we're going to do is let diff of i, comma j, comma k is equal to the shortest path from like a vi to a vj through a v1 vk. So we're computing the shortest path between these two nodes that uses the set of vertices v1 through vk. And we're sort of going to inductively build up the small subproblems, and then we'll uh, return the final answer of all the pairs. Right? We're going to reuse the paths. If a path needs to be reused, we can simply call it from this stored memory structure. Now, that looks like a three-dimensional array, but when we implement it, it'll end up being two-dimensional, it turns out, right? Um, every, consider like we've already computed all this inductively, like, like by an induction hypothesis, and we want to consider the k plus one-th node or something, or just the kth node, right? So if we're at like vi, uh, and we're, we want to go to vj, there's two paths. Um, and we have some node k here, right? Vk. And we want to, we're, we're considering vi, v, ij k minus 1 has already been computed for us and stored somehow, right? We want to, the, every path is either through a vertice or not through a vertice. There's only two cases. So if it's not through the vertice, we have this path. And that's going to be stored as dist uh, from i to j, uh, but it doesn't include k. So it will be the answer of the shortest path, considering not considering that vertex, if that vertex never existed, then the shortest path is still the same. So this is k minus 1. You agree? Um, what about uh, the, what if we have to go through vk? Well, that's going to be the shortest path from v1 to vk. Not including itself. And then the path from k j k minus 1, not including itself, right? Yes? Ah, so we're inductively building up the small subproblems. The v i j k is a three-parameter thing, three-dimensional. It contains the values of the shortest path from v i to v j, but only that ones that go through the first k vertices. If we have 20 vertices, v i 3 would Consider the, all the, sh the shortest path from i to j that only goes through the first three vertices. Then the second, then we do i j four, i j five, i j six. Finally, we have i j n, the number of vertices. That's going to be the all pair shortest path. We sort of like do one vertice at a time. We add a vertice and then update everything, and then we add a vertice in its edges and we update everything. We add a vertice in its edges and update everything. That's sort of the way it's going to look. Right, um, and that's basically the property that we're going to look at. It's very similar to the Dijkstra's property. Um, we don't need a 3D memory structure, though. We can do it simply two-dimensional. This is also called the V3 algorithm, simply because uh, implementing this is almost trivial. Um, so first, we need to just write down a, a memory structure. So we're going to say uh, allocate uh, an array dist. Of, uh, of size uh, n by n. And for all i, uh, dist i i is going to take on 0. Now, dist is, this is a 2D memory structure where it's going to contain the values from i to j. 
right? So instead of the 3D, we'll define the 3D memory structure with only storing quadratically many elements, right? We're recomputing all the tiny pieces of information to combine them into the big answer. Um, uh, for i in range, so you're going to just loop over the whole thing. Uh, for uh, j in range n, uh, dist uh, of i comma j is going to take on the edge value l of uh, i comma j if defined. And it's going to be uh, negative infinity, uh, excuse me, infinity otherwise. So this is simply allocation of the array. Here's the implementation of Floyd Warshall. Uh, for k in range n, for i in range n, for, excuse, yeah, for j in range n, n is the number of vertices. Um, dist of i j is going to take on, I'm sorry if you can't read that, the minimum of the current, which is dist i j, and uh, dist of i k plus dist of k j. Is that, is that legible? I don't know. Sorry, the markers are not working. It's making it worse. OK, so you update each one. Yeah, you can't see that at all. Dist i j. Dist ij takes on the, so the dist ij takes on the min of dist ij or dist ik plus dist kj. What is this? Dist ij is the current stored minimum path from i to j. Dist kj is the is the shortest path from i to k and then k to j. So that's the dist ik kj is the shortest path from i to j through k. Dist ij is the shortest path overall. Now, what are you going to do? The outest most loop is a k. So what you're doing is you're con computing all the shortest paths that go through A or don't go through A, all the shortest paths that go through B or don't go through B, all the shortest paths that go through C or don't go, go through C, and at the end, you'll simply have all the shortest paths. Right? Yes? Uh, yeah. Directed sense, it, it's a simple modification as well. Let's do like a very quick example. What's the runtime of this? Yeah. 444. Four, four. This is all called the V3 algorithm for that reason. It's usually easy to memorize in a pinch, right? Um, I'm only going to do a few updates to this. Let's see. Undirected, undirected, and let's suppose positive weighted. So we're going to allocate an array. It's two-dimensional. And notice that the shortest path from A to B is the shortest path from B to A. So 
The rest of it is going to be infinity, but I'm just going to kind of leave that as blank for now. Then you're going to update all the edges. So it's going to be 5, A to B is 5, A to D is 9, that's going to be a 1. Uh, B to C is going to be 2. Um, C to B is going to be 2 again. This is, C is going to be 7, uh, 7, 9, uh, 2. Uh, A to E is going to be 1, of course. And then this is going to be 2. Right? Did I miss anything? Now, um, consider the last loop is going to be k. So consider all the paths that go through A or don't go through A. Right? So all the paths that go through A could be B to D or B to E. Right? Or D to B or uh, D to E as well. So those are the only ones we're going to update. So we look at uh, B to D, which is going to be uh, B to D, which is infinity. But we consider the shortest path of infinity versus 5 plus 9. And 5 plus 9 is 14, so that's going to be less. Uh, then we're going to consider the shortest path. Uh, this is going to be a 14 here as well. And then the shortest path from uh, B to E is going to update to be 9 plus, it's going to be 5 plus 1, which is 6. So what's in blue is what's updated after the first round, the first outer, outermost for loop of K. We consider all the paths that are length A that go through A, right? Uh, as we run the next round, the next, we're going to run all the paths that go through B, and that's going to update the only the C to A path. And, but also, not only the C to A path, but the C to E path, right? So the C to A path will be updated through B as 2 plus 5, which is 7. But then also, the C to E path will be updated to be uh, the C to A path, uh, excuse me, the B to E path, path plus this edge of, of C. So I have this as 8 here. And 8, right? So this two-dimensional matrix gets updated. You loop through the whole 2D matrix, which takes v squared time, and then you update it v times for each possible vertice that you, all the paths that could go through that vertice. This is the floyd warshall algorithm, right? You make v updates to a structure of size v squared, so the whole thing takes v cubed time, right? Uh, this is more, most interesting. We're more interested in single source shortest path problems. But this does beat running Dijkstra n times in the dense setting. All right, I'll be around if you have any questions.